All right, good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kevin Scott, K4GTR, XWB4BNU that nobody could ever remember. They kept getting that call sign, so I'm glad to finally got a vanity call that works. So tonight we're going to be talking about surface mounted technology. So I grew up, as probably some of you folks have too, in the vacuum tube days. Yeah, there you go, vacuum tubes. And I don't mean klystrons and magnetrons. That, well, magnetrons on a vacuum tube, but still those particular days. My science fair project in my senior year of high school was taking an old vacuum tube TV chassis that one of uh, my local hams gave me. Gave me two of those chassis. One of them I built a 40 meter CW transmitter out of. One best overall in the state or in the, uh, the high school and ended up going all the way to state with that. And you make improvements along the way. So I took the second chassis, created a 40 meter receiver, a lot of vacuum tubes. So I started off in vacuum tubes. In fact, in my microwaves class, and I'm not talking about a cooking class, but an actual microwaves class, the uh, grad instructor said, hey, who can tune up this amplifier here? Well, shucks, that's easy. You know, dip, peak, dip, peak, a whole bit. I was the only one know how to do that. So ham radio has been a wonderful, wonderful teacher all my life. My very first job out of high school, high school, out of college, was with Motorola. And the first product they gave me to work on, and I was a manufacturing engineer with them, was the Sensar Pager. For those of you who don't know about it, it was the first all surface mount device. Like, what? What surface mount? You know, I'm used to using all these leaded components. It was the first surface mounted pager within the Motorola pro portfolio. And it eventually became a display pager. The first one was a five, six tone beeper. And then they had a digital beeper, and then it became the display pager. But there was a little pen pager. If you've ever seen one of these, this is all surface mount, with the exception the crystal in there was leaded. But everything else was all surface mount. The IC was surface mounted. So I want to at least go over a little bit of the history of why surface mount and, you know, hey, vacuum tubes work fine. Why not just stick with that? You wouldn't be able to have your cell phone nowadays if you had vacuum tubes. It just wouldn't work. So some of the common features, you'll sometimes hear SMD, SMT interchangeably, but SMT is the technology, surface-mounted technology. A device is a SMD, surface-mounted device. And there's also for other things that you'll hear them, you know, chips. A lot of the, the components are called chips because they essentially are little chips of ceramic or whatever it happens to be of the substrate for capacitors, resistors, inductors, and other different devices, ICs as well. Uh, you'll see some different transistors that you'll take the different leaded packages, TO92, TO220. Those of you who use for regulators are the TO5s, the big monsters for your 12 volt, 13.8 volt regulators. Then they went into surface mounted devices. Well, the SOT, and I'll show you some pictures of comparisons, the size differential is immense. The SOT is a small outline transistor, and then you also have the SOIC a small outline integrated circuit. And if you remember the DIPS, dual inline package and SIP, single inline package ICs and other different arrays. Well, this is basically its smaller neighbor. Being the SOIC, you can really shrink the package size down. So you always had an eight pin SO or DIP package. The NE555, real popular um, integrated circuit for doing timers and stuff like that. Well, they had an SOIC version. And it was like one fourth the size. So it really scrunched things down. And then you have 8 pins and 16 pins and all sorts of different configurations. So we'll go show you some of that stuff. The integrated circuit was definitely something that was spawned out of the whole semiconductor revolution. Like, wow, I can have multiple transistors in one little package or diodes or whatever else. And that whole plethora was born to really shrink things down. Like I said, I, if I had a cell phone that was made out of vacuum tubes, who was it that was showing us the, uh, oh, no, it was over at Sonny's Barbecue uh, showing pictures of this pack mule radio station that was just huge, and they had 12-volt car batteries. They had another mule that was carrying them out in the boonies, so they just wouldn't be able to do that. So some other common terms, acronyms, and stuff like that as far as things that you'll find. Like, we usually use solder, good old-fashioned wire solder. Okay, well, 
In the surface mount world, yes, you can still use that when you're hand placing, but the beauty about surface mount, it really tends to uh, be an open door to automation. Take the labor out, take the cost out, it really shrinks the size down. So solder pads are on the circuit board. You got solder paste that gets put onto those pads, which is kind of, it's a mixture of tiny, tiny, tiny solder balls and flux, which tends to be kind of sticky. So when the part's put down on that paste, it'll stay put until it goes through this oven that heats up the solder and, and does its magic. So a solder stencil is basically, if you've ever taken and made t-shirts, you make a stencil and put the paste or the, uh, the paint through it and then whoop, whip it off. It's the same thing with the surface mounted technology. You have this solder paste, you run this squeegee right across the stencil, it deposits solder on the pads, you pop it up and now, and I'll show you some of that, some cool pictures about that. Pick and place, those fancy machines, that, and some are actually very simple, but the bigger ones are just putting down thousands of parts uh, in an hour. It's just incredible amount, uh, even tens of thousands of parts in one hour. It's really fast. Tape and reel machine. So the tape and reel is very commonly packaged for surface mounted parts. There's the tape and the reel. So a little piece of tape right here, there's little pockets the tape over the top that you peel off, and these are what the components are in. Later on, you'll be able to walk up here and you'll see there's little pieces of black and silver on here. Those are actual capacitors that I pulled out of there so you can see what they look like. But you'll see a lot of them, they come in tape and reel. It just makes it so much easier for the machines to be able to pull the parts off of these little pockets and put them right on the circuit board. It makes for uh, incredible automation. In fact, the funny thing is when I first went to work for Motorola, now you have programming for these pick-and-place machines. Back then, they actually had, if you remember what a stock market ticker tape looked like, it was that. It was this long piece of paper, it had little punches, and that's what they programmed the pick-and-place machine with paper. You make a mistake, you got to generate a whole new piece of paper again. Painful, but it was a start. So once again, you have the vacuum tubes. And one of the things that the vacuum tube or the valve technology people came up with in 1959 is a new Vista. It's a very, very small one over there. Runs at a lower voltage. Uh, it was kind of their last gas to really make vacuum tubes useful for smaller and smaller electronics. You would think that it would be, I was thinking originally new Vistas were around like in World War II, but according to what I found, it was not. It was something later on. Okay, so there was some things that was smaller. The new Vista came of that, but because I do have a World War II era Navy receiver, and it's got some really small tubes. Yep. The question, well, it was more of a comment about what these tubes were back then. It's called a pencil tube. It was much smaller. So it worked out. So you can see. You know, it really shrunk down in size, but then you get into the next group. This big one here, that's the T05 package. And then on down, there's a T092. And then this one in the bottom left corner, that's the SOT23 transistor. So a 2N2222, very common transistor. Instead of being in this bigger package here, the T092, you get it in that little small package. You can fit a lot of them in that same kind of space. So it's amazing how much better you can get. Lower power consumption, lower cost, you know, physical size, so much smaller, you can get much, much better density. There's not only power consumption, but there's power capability. So when you get power capability, you still have to use the bigger. You do. So they do have their techniques, but for something like a 2222, depends what it's used for, if it's a signal like a receiver signal amplifier, yes. If it's for a power amplifier, then you need something a bit bigger, for sure. Yes? Uh, one other point, maybe you're going to make this later, but <laughs> it's on the extra exam. Um, the, the, uh, the smaller packaging also means that the lead length between components is reduced, and that has a significant impact oh, on I'm gonna high get into that. frequency. I'm yes. going to get into yeah. that big time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dip, dip packages and whatnot have uh, considerable loss of frequency. In you see my third line there? Operates at higher frequencies. You try to operate in microwaves with a tube, pretty tough. They did some of that stuff back in 
World War II, but it was really tough. Forget the cell phones, what they're doing now on Wi-Fi, 5 gigahertz, no way. You're not going to be able to do it. It's just too big, too large, uh, too spread out. But we'll go into self-resonant frequencies, one of the things we're going to. Some are 2.4, some are like 900. It's a magnetron. Here, we have the question. Kevin, if you can. Hello, we're recording this, so if you've got questions, you need to speak up so we can get this on our guards too. That's, that's the only reason we're kind of waiting for microphones because the audio equipment can pick most of it. <coughs> so the question was about microwave ovens, what frequency they operate on, 2.45 gigahertz. Typically, there are some that are 900. Now there is, and I want to say it's Lucky Gold Star came up with an IC or a transistor that op actually operates on these frequencies to replace the magnetron in a microwave oven. And I have not seen any of these yet because it's a bit more expensive and microwaves have gotten so cheap. But you can actually put several of these radiators <coughs> throughout your microwave oven to give you more even heating. So, but I haven't seen too many of those. But that was like five years ago or more that I saw that was out there. Hold on. And then we get into mixed technology as well. So you can see sometimes you can have leaded parts, but then you go to surface mount parts, and sometimes you may have a mixture. But the key things about surface mount, the advantages of surface mount over leaded, obviously size, density, uh, manufacturability. It's just so much faster to be able to go ahead and instead of manually placing. And there are automated machines that will place leaded components, but you know, you're basically taking a machine that's taking those leads and crunching them down. And if they're slightly bent, you're going to eh, jam it, and it's not going to go in there. It's just not as conducive for manufacturability. Certainly higher frequency of operation, as I mentioned. And uh, we'll go into their self-resonant frequency. Power, it consumes much less power now when you need to dissipate more power. Then, of course, you have to have heat sinks and other different devices. But you can still have, and I don't know if this one has it. I've got another picture that shows... Some of the surface mount, they're called D-packs. It's kind of like a TO220 package with a fin on top, except this one's meant strictly for surface mount. And it's usually you find those in regulators. And we'll get to that. What about repairability was the question. You know, we'll get to that. Uh, it definitely requires some different techniques. Uh, it's still, you can do it. I'm going to show you, you can do it with a plain soldering iron. Now, when it comes to the ICs, you really need, like, hot air. It's different. But for a two-liter component resistor, capacitor, inductor, you can still easily repair them with a pair of soldering iron tips. It's not a big deal. Done it all the time. It's just a certain technique. But you need, because it's smaller, you need a microscope. But you don't, here's the beauty, though. Here's one thing I would like to mention. Bring up a good point, and I don't even have this in here. But how many use solder suckers for pulling out the leaded? Now, I want to let you know about this one. This is one that was recently brought to my attention. It's got a silicon, flexible silicon uh, hose at the end of it. This works wonderful. 15 bucks on eBay. I'm sorry, uh, Amazon. And it even comes with an extra strip in case it wears out. You got more in there, and you can cut it to size. Unlike the ones that come with a Teflon piece that's stiff, it doesn't really seal real well. This seals wonderfully. Where I was sitting there... You know, sucking three or four times trying to get the solder out and it never quite gets it. This thing sucks all that solder out. And the problem with a leaded component, you're trying to suck the solder out of a plated through hole. And there's always some little area that still touches. So even though you've sucked the solder out of it, you're trying to pull the lead out and it's still stuck. It's kind of one of the pains about, like those resistors there, trying to pull those out. You have to pull them out either while they're hot. So you stick a little screwdriver underneath there, heat them up, pull them out. Um and make sure you don't pull the via hole out. Surface mount, not a big deal. I take soldering iron on both sides. Once it's heated up, or take hot tweezers. There's, you can buy those if you want. That's a little more complicated. Now, you'll see some pictures of that. And it comes off real easily. So from a repairability standpoint, in many cases, it's easier. Now, when it comes to the real small parts, I find there's a balance between using soldering iron or a hot air gun. And hot air, sometimes, if you have too much airflow, part's gone. And if you don't have enough airflow, you'll keep it there forever. You'll burn up the board trying to get the part hot enough. It's a balancing act. 
So many advantages. So why is surface mount so much better for higher frequencies? You have what is called self-resonant frequency. There was a time back in 2012, I was working for this one company called Nivus over in Smyrna. And we had this IoT or Internet of Things transceiver running at 900 megahertz. And the previous engineer who was on the product couldn't get it working. They fired him. They opened up the job. I went ahead and applied for it. Wanted to get out of where I was working. And I just wanted to do RF engineering again. It was great. I figured out pretty quickly what he did. Uh, with every type of IC, there's always a sample circuit that they have in there. Well, the guy built the sample circuit exactly like it was in the book, except the sample circuit was at 433 megahertz. So he used components that were designed for that frequency, not 900 megahertz. Well, it turns out the self-resonant frequency of that inductor, it turns out that the inductor, which is supposed to be used as an RF choke to block any RF from getting into the DC line, was actually more like a capacitor. As you get higher in frequency, that inductor becomes a capacitor. Same thing with capacitors, as you get higher in frequency, they can become like an inductor. What causes that are your lead components, and as you see right here in the bottom, there's a model of a capacitor self-resonant point where it'll be mostly capacitance, and you get over here and whoop, and it turns into an inductance. As you can see, it has one over two pi FC on the left side, two pi FL on the right side. There's that resonant point that it changes, and why is that? because a lead inductance as well becomes significant. You also have some inner electrode capacitance between those two leads, not usually significant, but it will end up changing the properties. Even more so for inductors, you've got this model here of an inductor where the leads themselves, there's some lead inductance in there, but you also have in between the windings, you've got little capacitors in between the windings as well. So that also changes the properties of that particular part. I fix this problem by going to a part, it fit on the same pad, but instead of a self-resonant frequency at 900 megahertz like this one did, it was a six gigahertz. Whoop, fixed the problem, and we didn't have to lay the board out. My boss was real happy, so that worked out real well. But this is really, really important with a lot of high frequency components. Take a look, whenever you're on DigiKey, Mauser, or whatever else, look at your data sheet. If you're gonna be designing something for VHF, UHF, and above, look at the self-resonant frequency of those components. Not everyone's the same way. You have an inductor, a chip inductor, it's either on a ceramic base or a ferrite base or some other type of base. They will have different properties that will have given them different self-resonant frequencies. Oh, I got a 1.2 microhenry inductor on here. Well, at your frequency of operation, it may not be 1.2. It may be a capacitor. So you really, it's really important to take a look at that. But with surface mount, it's very predictable. With a leaded component, it depends how long you leave the leads. Like, oh, I'm going to leave the leads on because it's easy to repair. Well, that'll mess you up from an RF perspective. So for DC, no big deal. Power supply, not a big deal. RF, huge deal. So that's some of the things I wanted to at least compare between surface mount and digital. If you take a very look at the top, take a look at those components that are sitting above. There's your surface mount device equivalent versus the leaded component and how much smaller they are. Makes a really big difference. So the different chips, I mean, chip inductors, chip resistors, chip capacitors are pretty much that way. Uh, transistors, they don't typically call these chips because they're not a chip of ceramic. They're usually some sort of plastic epoxy type base with the lead forms and everything else. But you can see there's a whole pile of different IC equivalents. There's the SOTS, there's the PLCC, I've used those SOIC. They can be pretty big, and there's some with gall wings that kind of like sit flat on the board. There's also some really nasty beasts that are called BGAs. You're not going to be doing that. And I'm showing you all the different things, and we'll get back to Earth in a moment, but I at least wanted to show you all the benefits that are from surface-mounted technology. And even the transistors. There's your SOT23, and then you can have smaller parts, the 323, the 523, there is this one part, it's an SC, I think, SC70 package, and we have a six-pin version, two of them, on this one board from my company. And lordy, that is a pain in the neck to solder because it's so tiny, and the board pads that are, or the pads that are on the board are, like, really small, too, so it doesn't solder real well. We fix that on an X-Revision board, but that's just one of the headaches you have to go through. 
So the different types of inductors, you see there's chip inductors. This is a ceramic-based chip inductor. Here's a toroid. In fact, these right here, those are toroids inside. Those are inductors that they're surface-mounted parts, and you see some big old leads. But those will handle some typical pretty good amount of current. So I've used those before in various power supplies and stuff like that, and you can get them pretty big. Uh, the resistors, you have your leader resistors, but then look how small your surface mount of resistors can be. I mean, you really are shrinking stuff down. So it really makes a big difference on the size. This big bad boy in the middle, that's a BGA, a ball grid array. And any of your integrated circuits that are used for microprocessors, that's the package they typically use because there's so many connections. They're blind connections, and it requires special techniques to be able to solder those as well. Desolder them, repair them, put them back on. You're not going to do it with just a plain old soldering iron, sorry, or even a hot air machine. It's a little tough. But it allows you to be able to really shrink packages down such that you can get to our wonderful smartphones we have nowadays. If it weren't for that technology, you wouldn't have the smartphones fitting in the palm of your hand. Just look at the evolution of the cell phone. Wish I'd brought this one box with me, but cell phones originally with this big brick. You put in a briefcase, and then they had something a little smaller that was still kind of big honking thing, and then they went to the like MicroTAC from Motorola as a, a little flip for the, the handpiece, but it still was a pretty good sized phone. Then the StarTAC came out, and that was a true flip phone, and then smaller and smaller and smaller, but it was strictly a cell phone. Then Apple came up with the iPhone, and know Motorola is already starting to work on a smartphone concept. BlackBerry came up with theirs. It, it basically combined pagers and, you know, internet and, uh, no, the cell phone technology. But when I was in Japan back in, I want to say, 95 or whatever, I was in one of their subways, and they were showing me a cell phone that they had for NTD Docomo, which is Do Communications Mobile. It's their version of their AT&T. And they actually had internet in their subways back in 95. It was amazing. Yes. I don't, I don't know if you heard about it, the, uh, the Boeing 737 that blew out a door at 40,000. They found a cell phone that got sucked out of it. It dropped 40,000 feet and was still working when they found it. <laughs> what brand was that? That'd be good advertisement. I, I don't remember the brand, but it was just amazing. That, it was an iPhone, yeah. <laughs> it was an iPhone, okay. Yeah. Well, I know when I was at Motorola, I mean, we had all sorts of drop testing that we would end up doing, like with pagers and then cell phones later on. We'd drop them from, you know, the... Oh, yeah. Well, we had actual different boxes, and we dropped them on steel plates, on concrete, all sorts of different stuff. So I'm sure when it dropped down, yeah, it was going pretty fast, but at the same time, probably hit some trees and branches. The beautiful thing about that whole thing, it didn't fall on anybody because that would have killed somebody. So thank God none of that happened. That was a blessing that it fell in the guy's backyard and some trees. Nobody got hurt. Uh, real quick story, my son, when he was at Georgia Tech, they ended up launching a balloon with an amateur radio payload. There were several of the kids that were hams in that group. They didn't design the parachute mechanism very well. And at about 50,000 feet, maybe 60,000 feet or whatever, it started hitting the jet stream. So instead of going up, all of a sudden it went, whew, hit this 100-mile-an-hour jet stream and ripped it off, and it fell down. We were watching it go up, up, up on APRS. And then within a short period of time, all of a sudden it went from up 55,000 feet, 60, all of a sudden at 3,000 feet. They're like, what the heck? It landed in somebody's yard in Loganville. Well, to, it was in a styrofoam box that, you know, was, uh, you know, for medical stuff, you know, styrofoam cooler with a thick wall. They put an aluminum block in there to help wait to pull the thing back down. That had fallen on anybody. I mean, so they were very fortunate. They got it all back because they had a card. If found, please call. And they were able to get it. So, yes, once again, stuff falling out of the sky, not a good thing. But that was very fortunate. So without smartphones, now this is an older iPhone. They don't have those big SIM card holders <laughs> anymore. But I just wanted, this was a good picture that really showed all the different integrated circuits in there. The shield covers off so you can see all the components and especially all the little tiny trans, uh, resistors and capacitors and stuff all around the perimeter of the ICs. And those ICs have all sorts of goodies inside them. So, and that was a Samsung up there, and it's got some shielding on there as well that are over the different ICs. But you can see how highly dense they are. 
And the key thing, it's also not just on the one side. There's components on both sides of those boards. So they run them through the oven, and which I'll go over in just a little bit. So the different, how you get such large capacitance in a small package is you have all these different layers. So you get a ceramic capacitor, and it um, has all these different layers here that allow you to be able to get a large amount of capacitance. The one issue with them as well, you need to make sure you put them in a section of the board that doesn't bend because they're also susceptible to cracking because it's ceramic. Ceramic's a brittle material. And you'll get a cracking that'll cause what is called electromigration. You get moisture in there. It'll eventually short out the capacitor. So you really have to watch out when you design stuff to make sure you have a thick enough board. Some of these cell phones, the boards are like ultra thin, like 10 mils thick, really tiny. So, in order, But they're very flexible in that case. But they, they're trying to take weight and size so they can fit into a very small phone. I started mentioning earlier about mixed technologies, and there's a D-pack right here. So that's the same as the TO220, but it's meant to solder down, and you've got all this ground plane on here to provide extra dissipation for the heat. So that's most likely a regulator, because you've got all sorts of electrolytic capacitors. In some cases, it makes sense just to keep using leaded components, like the toroids, electrolytics. There are some electrolytics that do have a package that sits on that's for surface mount. The key thing about any surface mount device, it must be able to withstand a temperature of like 230 degrees Celsius. Celsius. So, because they go through that reflow and it has to be able to heat. There are some components that can't handle the heat, therefore they cannot go through SMT processes. They have to be hand soldered or go through a wave solder process later. And that's where the electrolytics, some of them are very heat tolerant, some are not, depends. So, you'll see all sorts of different, in fact, there's three different D-packs there. And sometimes for connectors, you know, it makes sense to do a leaded part. There are some that are lead less, and they have little, you know, uh, angles to how the lead part goes through. There's your big BGA right there. You can't see any of the pads because they're all completely blind underneath. But that's the beauty about this. You can really get some stuff going. So the whole process, uh, I can show you some videos. I don't have them here right now, but this is a standard SMT process. You've got that one box at the very end. That's actually where the circuit boards, the blank circuit boards are stored. And they go on a conveyor, go into this first machine, which is a screen printer. It takes the solder paste and screens it onto the actual board itself. So that way the parts will end up sticking to that solder pad. Then it goes through the pick and place machine. Uh, you see the reels, just like I got these reels here, except there's some really big reels for big parts, stuff like that. It puts all the parts in place. Then they go through a reflow oven, which I'll pop up here real quick. Oh, if you look inside the reflow oven, there's a pretty big one. It's got different zones that it's controlled temperature. It's meant to slowly heat it up to a particular temperature where the solder melts, and then it quickly ramps on back down. If you heat a board up too quickly and there's any moisture in it, boop, it'll pop it. So you destroy the board. So there's a, a definite process to this. It's taken time to be able to understand how this all works. So with the solder paste, you basically you have the stencil that you see that silver. It's a thin metal sheet. And sometimes they're four mils or four thousandths of an inch thick, and sometimes three and a half mils, really, really small, thin. But you end up taking the solder paste, and that's what that gooey looking stuff is. And they run that squeegee across some rubber piece that takes in the solder deposits through the hole, and then when they're all done, they lift it up, and then you see you have solder paste sitting on those pads. You place the parts on there, and there they sit until you run through the reflux. They're not going to be flopping all over the place like you would if you didn't have anything to stick them in place. So it's kind of like glue, but it's solder. Then, of course, your pick-and-place machines. This one we call a Gatlin gun. It's got a whole pile of things. To so see this thing run in person is incredible. Go on YouTube. You'll see all sorts of videos of these things going ching, 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 ching. And it, except it's not doing that fast, it's going 10 times that fast. It's amazing how fast they end up going. But they end up, these things are moving around like crazy, and they're picking up parts. Not only are they picking up parts, they're also taking a look and see what orientation it is. They're identifying it, make sure this is the right size part, right orientation. Sometimes they'll even test them ahead of time to make sure it's measuring a certain resistance value. And it's incredible what these machines can do. So the parts that are put on you know, are right from the beginning. So those are those pick-and-place machines. Reflow ovens. We've got one of these at work right now. We, we can do our own little homemade boards if we want. 
And that's where you end up having your own little uh, reflow oven, or you can even get crazy. Oh, I was going to show you. Well, I'm going to show you in the next phase when we get back down to earth. So this is what we do commercially, everybody. And now from an amateur radio perspective, we come back down to earth. So you can do this yourself. You can lay out your own circuit board. You can uh, put your components down. You can either do it by hand as far as soldering them individually. It's a little slow, but, hey, it's slow when you're popping leaded parts in and soldering them as well. It takes a little bit of time. But with this one, you can also, like JLC, PCB, and Oshpark, these companies that make the boards, they'll also make you a little stencil that goes along with your boards. So you can take that. You can get solder paste from Amazon, pretty cheap. Get your own little squeegee and just run it across here, peel it up, do it yourself. I think Micro Center may even have some of this stuff. In fact, I know they have solder paste because I was just there yesterday. And they have some stuff for the hobbyist that you can do that yourself. Once you lay that out, have that solder paste in there, you can sit there and pop your parts on there with tweezers and just drop them in place. Even if it's not perfect, when you solder it, when it runs through that oven, is you can take a little toaster oven and modify it to actually create your own little oven to to melt the solder, it will, just because of the viscous nature of the molten solder, will realign the part slightly. So it's really cool to see that. So you can do that yourself. So this is a standard technique if you want to do it by yourself. This is the easiest thing to do. They show a solder pen, I'm sorry, a flux pen. It has a little bit of flux on there. You always want to add a little bit of flux. Just like the solder that I have here, it's got rosin core inside, which is great. Uh, and you can do that as well, but you got to pre-tin your pads just to make sure there's no oxidation on there. Just touch up one of the pads, put a little solder paste on there, uh, paste, flux on there, add a little bit of solder to at least get one side. So then you solder that one part. As you see, I'm tinning the pad, add the part here. I tin the one side. Once that one side is soldered, then it's the other side is easy to solder because it's already mechanically held in place. So it's a pretty easy way to go ahead and just do this manually. I've got a kit that I just got. It's for a, um, a whisper transmitter, or I think it's a transceiver. And it came with surface mount parts already installed because it's cheap and easy for them to do, plus they feel that a lot of hams are afraid of doing that, but it's really not that bad. It takes a little time. Doing the IC takes a little bit longer, and if you have a hot air machine, you're much better off doing that. But you can still do that by hand if you have the right tip. Make sure your tip is very, very small, very fine. The last thing you want is a tip that's so huge it covers multiple pads at once. You don't use your 100-watt Weller gun. You don't even get it near your board. So these are all pencil, pencil type. In fact, this came out. I mean, I've got my pencil iron here. That's typically what you end up using. And I've got some ones from work that are really very small, fine tips that you can use for these small parts. There are some other ones that I'll use. It's a slight flat tip, and it really does a nice job of hitting some of the larger parts. And you, you know, the key is minimal amount of time spent on the pad will save your pads and components. So you want to heat something up quick, add your little bit of solder, and go back. The last thing you want is a big glob of solder on your pad. So some of the things like this right here, Steve, you said you do cold solder joints. Uh, that's not what you want to see. The solder's real grainy looking. You want it to be nice and shiny. These up here, those are good solder joints. And this gives you some examples of too much solder, right amount of solder from a side view of what these you know, surface mount components actually look like. And some things that you'll find in an automation process you won't find when you're hand soldering typically is what they call tombstoning, the freestanding they have there, we typically call tombstoning because it's whoop, laying up, or anything that's shifted, rotated out of the way, but something that's nice and even on the pads, and when solder is melted, it will actually auto-align when it's all molten. So that works out nicely. Um, it's really important that you are able to see your components, have some good tweezers, that have some really fine tips. So I've got these right here. Straight ones or curved ones, depends on what you're trying to do, but they work very, very well. So I've got some different things that you definitely, and I'll bring this for next week as well, solder, solder flux, things like that to be able to make sure, and 
as far as the scope material, this is a great tool. I picked this up for like 100, maybe 80 or 90 bucks off of uh, Amazon. And this one has LED lights on it. It's got a little display on here. And if I had uh, the right cable, it's got a mini HDMI connector on here. You could hook it up to a really big monitor as well. But if you can see my fingers, uh, can you see the display? Oops. Can you all see the display down here? So this microscope does a pretty good job. It's a good 10x. Thank you, sir. It's a good 10x, and that'll help you to be able to see what's going on. We'll play with that. I'll bring a bigger monitor with me so you can really see what's going on. There was one monitor I meant to get at work. It was this nice thing that this one guy got off of eBay for like 35 bucks, 25 bucks. It's a Samsung, and it's this tray with this light and a camera, and it goes to a you know, big screen uh, monitor as well. But it's got a really nice setup. You can magnify and, and really get a good view of the whole board. The key thing when it comes to soldering with any of these things, you want to make sure you have plenty of room to get to your board with a soldering iron. The last thing you want to do is have this so close to your board that you're constantly hitting your magnifier with the soldering iron because you'll melt it. Not a real good thing. So you want to have make sure you have plenty of space. And that's what this is actually for, for soldering. It's got plenty of space. I mean, it's already from this high, it's focusing on my finger. And we're talking probably a good five inches there. Plenty of room to go ahead and, and do that. So that's a real important feature to have. I've also got a microscope last year at the uh, Lawrenceville Ham Fest. I was fortunate some guy was selling some microscopes. I picked up a really nice stereo microscope with a really heavy base and everything else, really good professional for like 125 bucks. So I can do all sorts. In fact, I do some work. I brought it to work with me. I don't have room on my ham station at home, but it works great. So let's see, solder sucker, solder wick, pan of ice. You need something to be able to hold that board in place. So if I'm going to work on that board, I want something here that will hold that board in place. That can pop it in there. So something, otherwise it's going to be sliding all over the table when you're trying to solder it. You don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that board is held in place in some way or have some other fixture. Uh, what I a lot of times do when I'm doing any type of soldering I have a ceramic tile, just a piece of junk ceramic tile I got from Home Depot. And just like the space shuttle with those ceramic tiles, it takes all sorts of heat and just doesn't get hot. So it protects my table down below. And you can get some types of pads that will give you a little bit of stickiness to it that's also high heat resistance. will hold the board in place. Once again. So magnifying methods, I showed you the one. There's another one here folks have been looking at, 35 bucks, and they range like 25 to 35 or a little bit more from Amazon. This one also has an LED light on the front, so you can really see your work. You can aim it down. Um, also, it comes with different objective lenses here, so different magnification. This is like two and a half times. If you want to put two of them, there's actually a second one that will reach down here. And uh, if you want to really get some high magnification, It'll work like a charm. So this is a handy thing to put on your head. And like, oh, yeah, now I can see real well. So that's the only thing. You were talking about, uh, Joe, earlier about a vision test, being able to solder without glasses. There was this one contract manufacturer I worked with in China. And I'm used to working with, you know, people having microscopes and stuff like that. They had a repair area, and they were doing these really small parts and I would see these Chinese guys with, like, no glasses, and they're just real close looking, trying to get parts. And we're like, how are they soldering properly? They can't see squat. I got them to actually get a microscope eventually. I mean, this is a big company. you think they'd have a little bit of money to go find that. But they're relying on people's visions. Once they get too old and their vision's not so good, they go to another job. They can't really do that for very long. So it's really important to be able to see what you're doing. Microscopes are really helpful. There's all sorts of different methods you can use, but quite a few of them are quite inexpensive. Um, so you can get stuff used, but those things are, those jewelers' headsets are awesome. They really do a nice job. Or even the magnifying glass, uh, one of those, that's from Harbor Freight, so it's like 30 bucks or 
twenty bu five bucks. So those magnifying lighted lenses uh, do a really good job as well for most of what you're going to do. You're not going to do the real fine stuff anyway, I would hope. For more advanced repair and sometimes putting on parts, you have these hot air machines. They're very tricky in getting the air just right. As I mentioned, you can blow parts off. But if you notice here, these are different nozzles, and those nozzles give you different type of air currents, whether you have a very small hole, very large hole, and then you have some that just put air around the perimeter of your integrated circuit. So it's not heating up the whole body. It's only heating up the contacts, and then you can pull it off more easily. So those, when you get the right kind of stuff, that works out real well. Uh, this one also has a solder sucker built into it. So you got a soldering iron and a solder sucker, or unless that one's, no, that's a solder feeder. So it's soldering, and it's got a feeder where you feed the solder through the end there. There are some that do have solder suckers. There's other ones that have tweezers, hot tweezers, that you use to grab parts off. It's real easy to pull them off. But two soldering irons work fine. You don't have to invest a whole bunch of money. Um, some of those <laughs> will cost you like eight, nine hundred bucks for some of these more fancy ones. That one I think will cost about two hundred dollars, but you can get stuff really cheap as well and keep it simple. <clears throat> now our ovens, solder paste you can get off of uh, Amazon. It either comes in a tube like that you can smear over your stencil, which is that's what this is right here. That's just a very simple mylar stencil for your board. Or you can end up taking solder paste and a syringe and popping off your different, you know, pads if you want to do it individually like that. So you can get it in all sorts of different ways. Key thing about the solder paste, you can't let it dry out. Then it gets stiff. So you have to always keep it sealed up. So don't just buy it and like, hey, I'm going to keep it like drywall mud. And you go to open it up like, <gasps> it's evaporated. It's all dry. It's no good anymore. So it does need to be protected. Uh, but there's people that have taken their toaster ovens, and in fact, one guy I work with, he took a toaster oven, and that was his little reflow oven. And the key thing there is you need to make sure you monitor your temperature. It doesn't get too hot where it bakes the board. Uh, it doesn't get not hot enough so that it, you don't get a really good solder flow, especially across the whole board. You may get good solder flow in the perimeter of the board, but all the inside components are cold solders. They're not even connected at all, and they fall off. So there's still a little bit of playing around with that whole process to get that working right. So next week at the workshop, bring your laptop. Oh, wait, no, that's not that one. That'll be the following one. Oh, so bring your soldering iron if you've got them, uh, all these kind of things, solder wick. If you have small diameter solder, that works out real well. The larger the solder, the harder it is to get these small parts. You'll end up adding too much solder onto them. So you want to make sure you do a good job. So start with the really small stuff. And I'll bring plenty of boards. I've got plenty of SMT parts. We'll be able to play with them. So with that, we're getting done early, so I'm talking fast. I've got all these different parts and, and stuff. You want to take a look at them. There's pagers from the 80s and 90s and stuff like that where they were taking, these are all leaded components, and they were able to make a pager and stuff it all here. But then... I have some other ones that we now take and put surface mount parts, have components on both sides, and you can really shrink it down. So it, it makes a big difference. So come on, take a look at all this kind of stuff. If you have any questions, give me a holler. Um, plus, I'm on uh, the GARS email thread. Any questions? I will be at TechFest, but I'm going to give another presentation about, if you remember the world below 160 meters, I'm going to be talking about that again. All right.